expect to find in Peru the answers to some of the many enigmas of the megalithic engineering that's found in the Andes Mountains. What has really struck me about the sites in Peru at Tiahuanaco, uh, Machu Picchu, is the enormous stonework that the ancients actually created. Uh, I've been fascinated with it. I'm ab absolutely enamored with Machu Picchu. On previous trips to Peru, I have seen what are amazing enigmas with giant megalithic blocks perfectly cut and articulated what seems to be high-tech engineering far beyond what the ancient Incas were capable of doing. There's multiple aspects involved here. Step one is how do you cut this stuff thousands of years ago? Um, how and with what? And then once you get it cut for whatever reason, they've, they've got precise corner breaks and fillet radiuses down lengths that are unexplained, but they obviously had something to inspect these characteristics, to assure things were parallel, to assure they were perpendicular, and that goes out into another branch that, you know, just gets people thinking. places, you know, we'll, we'll be advancing the theory that Incas didn't build these walls and that they were already here in Inca times. Incas lived in these buildings, but they didn't build them. They were already standing here. This is the most famous stone in Cusco. It's the stone of the 12 angles. It's a stone that appears on the, the Cusco beer. And to a lot of people, this is like the symbol of of Cusco, this, this stone particularly. famous street in Cusco, Intiquiu. It goes down to the Cori Concha, the sun temple of the Incas, which is now a Catholic church. You'll see here what is called Royal Inca architecture. Just as today, Spanish are living inside these buildings, but they didn't build them. It may well be that the Incas also, though they lived in these buildings, didn't build them. This wall here is interesting because it shows how the stonemasons like to have fun. You have level rows of very perfectly fitting blocks, and then you get to this stone where they've decided to join the blocks diagonally this way. And uh, it's kind of a unique block in this whole wall right here, uh, which uh, is actually still quite stable uh, and has been through quite a few earthquakes. It's interesting to always look at some of the different walls that you see around Cusco. This one has some of the so-called primitive Inca construction, and then we see other large blocks put in here of certain patchwork. Kind of curious reconstruction of this wall.
And, and one of the questions that you know you have to ask is is why why would anybody go to such extreme effort to build with such giant stones? It's not necessary. I mean, they could be building with much smaller stones, but here they're they're building with giant stones, and it's. Well, they didn't have to put in as much effort as we would, that's why. I think that's it. Yeah, and, and so the reason why they are building with such giant stones is because it was easy for them, not because it was hard. Yeah. This is a particularly unique rock here, and many people think that it has to do with the Kundalini serpent energy that's taught in ancient India and that this whole figure here is of a snake and we see pictures of snakes carved in the stones in Cuzco. This one is particularly unusual because it's very deep and large carved into this granite and then you have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven chakras. It's thought that this corresponds to the kundalini energy in your spine going up through your chakras here. What we find right here at the seed of the Inca here at Sacsayhuaman, is that this seat right here is magnetized. And by bringing our compass along this stones right here, the compass is spinning. So there's a curious magnetic anomaly right here, some strong magnetic field that's either naturally in the rock or has somehow been artificially placed here. It's possible that this magnetic field actually has something to do with the moving of these giant stones. We're looking at a uh, processes or machine tools or uh, tool bits anyway that's uh, common to the uh, the builders of this facility, for want of a better word, the builders of uh, of this site and uh, and what they were doing in Egypt. Supposedly the Incas are building this, you know, 1300 AD, 1400 AD, even right up to, you know, Spanish conquest was really 1532. So, I mean, you know, at 14, they're saying like 100 years before the Spanish got here, 1430 or something, you know, they're building all this stuff. It's crazy, um, you know, but this is what the, when we go to Yonte Tambo, you'll see it's even more ridiculous. That's, on that side, that's where you can totally prove it. It's just ridiculous what they're saying. But right over here is the Inca slide and stuff. We'll see more of these weird um, smooth rocks here. And then, yeah, they've, they've carved little notches on it and stuff. I mean, it's bizarre. If this was actually carved by a, a glacier that was smoothing it out, you have to wonder why you're going to have these rough parts here. If there had been a glacier actually carving this, it would have smoothed out this entire stone. And you wouldn't have these rough knob, nods like this you just wouldn't really have that. Look at this curious stone and how it has a, a channel going through it. It's almost as if at one point there was some like aqueduct kind of thing here and that this big stone is all that's left but maybe water was being channeled down and then through here and then would have come out this area. You know, why would there just be a solitary stone like this? It must have been other blocks fitted up against it. And here you can see how the things here. It's water channel, yeah. Now this block here is curious with its, again, precision corners and then these like these, these scoops out. Now it's theorized, you know, by some people that 
these scoops were were used in the the construction of like ramming um, poles and stuff in here to hold up blocks while they're you know carefully chiseling chiseling them out. Yet not all the blocks have that; only some, and others rather than having scoops have knobs instead. Like there, you can see a couple of knobs up there. The theory is that these scoops and knobs were somehow used in the handling of the blocks. But it, again, exactly how they would have done it, 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 it's a mystery. I mean, it's thought that it was just brute force. Um, one of the strange things too with blocks like this is that in the traditional idea that they're constantly chiseling away to make it perfect, but that meant moving the blocks away, chiseling it a little bit, putting it back, seeing how it fit, moving it again, chipping it more, putting it back. And this constant trial and error of trying to get the blocks to fit right. I mean, it's really one of the great mysteries of how they, how they were such incredible stonemasons that they would just make all of the blocks fit perfectly. And it was definitely part of their technique that the, this perfect fitting was, was very much their style and they just weren't going to do it any other way. We're here at the top of Saxe Wam and above Cusco, and this is the area where there used to be several tall towers. We only can see the bases of these towers now. They were destroyed by the Spanish. But it's kind of interesting that originally here at Saxe Wam, there were two very tall towers. We'll also find a tower like these at Machu Picchu. So here at Kenko, we have this curious carving of this granite hill carved into steps and notches. It almost makes no sense. It, all, it, it would seem as if it was like a practice area for the, the stonemasons to come and, and practice their techniques of, of carving and uh, stone masonry. Was one of the stories too about Saxe Woman is that there are tunnels going all down through Saxe Woman that've been closed up by the Spanish, but according to the legends, the Incas hid this treasure from the Sun Temple in Cusco down inside this labyrinth of tunnels that goes deep under Saxe Woman and Cusco. These tunnels too are carved out of solid rock. They have different passageways going off to the side. You've got stories as well of people who've gone into these tunnels and disappeared for weeks. And when they finally appeared, they had gold peanuts and corn stalks made out of gold and other treasures that came out of the Cori Concha, the, the Sun Temple in Cusco. Here at Kenko, the, the blocks are all carved and steps are carved into solid rock. There's areas for rivulets to go down for blood or water. It's thought that yamas, alpacas were sacrificed here and then the blood allowed to flow down along the stones. This was the main road going to the Sacred Valley. So as you were going to the Sacred Valley, you would stop here at Tambo Mashai and then go on up this Inca road here up over the mountains, and then you would come back down into the Sacred Valley to the towns of Pizac, Urubamba, Kalka, 
Oyante Tombo. This gigantic block of granite, probably weighing several hundred tons, came from the quarry high above Ollante Tombo and across the river. It was squared, it was moved quite the distance towards the ruins, which are now just up here, but for some reason, this gigantic block never made it to the Sun Temple at Ollante. Behind me is the town of Ollante Tombo, and up this direction is the massive Sun Temple. In Inca times, there were only three megalithic cities that were inhabited during Inca times and are still inhabited today. Cusco is one of them, another town is called Chinchero, and the third is this town of Ollante Tombo. People are still living in the ancient buildings as they did in Inca times. This is one of the giant andesite blocks that comes from the top of the Sun Temple up there. It's been quarried. It's got even some drill holes here. It probably has fallen down from the top in the cataclysm that destroyed the Sun Temple in ancient times. A ramp that goes up the west side of the Sun Temple of Ollante Tombo, where they apparently dragged these massive stones. The lazy stones that never made it up to the temple that we just looked at are back down behind me over there. This is the very top of the main wall at the Sun Temple of Ollante Tombo. You can see how the narrow slivers of granite and the big blocks are perfectly fitted together up on top. There's a corresponding wall here. Yet we know that this is only some small portion of the gigantic building that was a rich granite are exactly as they were in Spanish times and in Inca times as well. None of these blocks has probably moved an inch for hundreds if not thousands of years. We see giant squared blocks of red andesite here. We see other blocks of red andesite there. This one probably weighing several hundred tons. But then we see this poor construction here. We see more of this poor construction here. We see this stone has been notched right here for another giant block. It's quite clear to me, really, that this is Inca construction here, while these giant blocks on either side are the megalithic pre-Inca construction that we're looking for. This is the main wall of the Sun Temple at Ollante Tambo. It consists of six giant slabs of andesite. 
and between them are these thin slivers of granite. You see here these giant knobs like this one, other curious knobs. And then here we have part of an Andean cross on this side of this slab. We also see here these knobs, more of these thin slivers of granite. Other knobs here, some have been chipped away. And then we come here to the edge of this massive wall, and we have this curious stone lying here. It appears to have been a lintel of a huge doorway that's fallen straight down. These giant blocks of red andesite granite didn't come from this site here that we're at. In fact, they came from this mountain on the other side of the river that's many miles away. The quarry on this mountain up here is massive blocks of granite that have come down from the mountain, almost like they've been blasted off of this granite mountain. Many of them are squared high up in the mountain and then brought by trails down for many miles and then they have to cross the river then come back up this mountain here at the Sun Temple of Ollante Tambo and then are put into place. This is an engineering feat that is perhaps unequaled in mankind, bringing massive blocks of granite many miles and across a river up another mountain and then perfectly placed where we see them today. It's almost a superhuman effort. This block is particularly interesting because it has what we call keystone cuts on it. Keystone cuts are these T-shaped cuts in the stone and then another stone is fitted against this with a corresponding T-shaped cut and then a copper clamp or some other metal is poured into these grooves forming what's called a keystone cut. We find these unusual keystone cuts also at Tiwanaco in Bolivia, which is an admittedly pre-Inca building. We also find keystone cuts like this in ancient Egypt, in ancient Turkey, in ancient Greece, and in other parts of the world. When you're talking about a later culture coming in and working with these blocks, that's, that's the technology they had. Very, very small elements, easy to handle, I mean, you see it today, that's how they build their houses. That's right, so I mean, that's part of the point here is that someone was able to build with giant blocks of stone. And oh yeah, very easily. Yeah, and it Obviously, wasn't hard for them, but, no. but that probably wasn't the Incas doing that. Well, if this is Inca, again, if that, the lower part is Inca, then this isn't. This giant block of andesite appears to have been standing up and was pushed over onto this platform that was made for it. Here we see slabs that are still in place. They're weighing uh, hundreds of tons, perfectly fitted together. Joints are perfect. We have this curious uh, raised bit of stone here in the central part. More knobs here more fitting here. But what this wall was originally, we really have no idea. Here again, we have one of the unusual keystone cuts that's been cut into this block. And of course, naturally, another giant block would have been fitted against it with a corresponding keystone cut on this side. The Incas were really not known for building with keystone cuts. This is something that instead we find at Tiwanaku. This wall right here at the Sun Temple of Ollante Tambu is actually extremely important. You see these quite large blocks of andesite here. You see the poor construction of filler right here. This is the Inca construction. But most importantly, we see this keystone cut here on this block. 
we only have one half of a keystone cut and this is extremely important because there's no way that the original builders of this wall would ever have cut a keystone cut here and not have another wall attached to it with a corresponding keystone cut. And in fact, this block had to have originally have been uh, horizontal because a keystone cut cannot be poured on a vertical block like this. It's absolutely clear to me that this wall itself has been destroyed and reconstructed all in prehistory before the Spanish. Probably the builders who reconstructed this wall were even pre-Inca themselves and later the Incas came in and filled in with this mud mortar construction we see. Walls. It's, it's very famous here at Ollante Tambo. Has a lot of the polygonal jigsaw uh, cutting and fitting of the blocks. One of the reasons for this is it provides more surface area for the blocks to lock in together and creates a great deal more stability for these gigantic walls. You have to wonder too why they wanted this. They clearly, as they built such walls like this, this was important to them that they had these little notches and uh, corners that were fitting in together. It was to keep them from being uniform and by providing extra surface area, the blocks held together better during the many Andean earthquakes that are so severe. This great doorway here is also quite interesting. It's built out of uh, quite large blocks of granite weighing uh, many tens of tons. And then here you see the articulation of the blocks coming in, very uniform, coming down to the corners. This is extremely fine construction some of the finest construction ever in the world. These fine granite blocks here at Ollante Tambo are also curious for this corner here where the blocks have actually been carved around this corner and then notched and fitted here perfectly. This is quite curious construction and something we also see in uh, Egypt at the Valley Temple of Kephron and at the Osirion and other areas of Egypt that are thought to be pre-Inca. Okay, this stone right here, uh, while it does not actually display the extreme precision that we find on the stones in Egypt, it's still a considerable amount of work to uh, create this. It's, it's fairly uh, flat along the surface, and they went through a considerable amount of time and work putting this notch in. For what reason? That's a mystery. We uh, check the corner radius on that other block 
And I also, we find the same condition or the same radius in this one. And again, the thing to really point out is that these, are, these were used for construction purposes. Um, the, the kind of precision that we find in Egypt, they must have had a much higher purpose, a technological purpose. And even though we may say, okay, <clears throat> for water management or hydraulic management, um, that is a technological purpose and these blocks may have been, had some, uh, some function in a hydraulic device. Um, the precision, you, you don't need that kind of precision for uh, hydraulics. I get the impression that we have a lot of anomalous carving on the, on the face of the mountain. You see these niches uh, cut into the mountain. For what reason? Um, I don't know. But if you take it into the, in, to consideration with what we find in Egypt, where there was an advanced acoustic technology, it's almost like they were carving the mountain out to tune it to specific, particular frequencies. And perhaps these were acoustic horns uh, uh, that were left in the face of the rock. But for what? What other reason, I mean, what reason would they have to do this work? Well, to get a uh, corner radius like this, you would have to use a tool that uh, has a dimension of five eighths of an inch because what we have is a five sixteenths radius. So, um, typically, if you were working with stone to uh, to create these artifacts, um, the work that it would take to actually go from a larger radius, which obviously you would have to use a larger tool to start with and then come down to this smaller radius, there would have to be some significant purpose for, to, in order to do that because the amount of work involved is, is tremendous. And uh, that's not to say that they, can't, they couldn't have done it, but I, uh, I have my doubts. I mean, the volume of work that we see around here it certainly indicates that they had a very efficient way of uh, performing this work. We're on the trail going up to the megalithic quarry high above Oyante Tombo where the big blocks of granite are. This is our guide, Mario. Speaks pretty good English and uh, of course fluent in Quechua. He's from the village of Oyante Tombo and he's studying to be a tourist guide. <laughs> Mario, 
This is one of the tired stones. One of the stones coming from the quarry up on the mountain that was supposed to go down to the river and then up the other side to the Sun Temple at Ollante Tombo. For some reason, this one didn't make it. It's one of the smaller stones actually, but it still weighs many tons. So you have to wonder, why would the Incas or even the pre-Inca stonemasons want to come up here on top of this mountain and then quarry these 100 ton, 200 ton, 500 ton blocks of granite and then with some superhuman effort just drag them miles down this mountain across a river and then up the mountain on the other side to the Sun Temple. And it makes you think, could it have been actually easy for them to do this rather than so incredibly difficult as it would appear? So this giant block of granite here in the quarry has already been partially split open. They're trying to separate this part of the rock. This giant block right here has also been cut or chipped away and moved. Here you see the, the splitting of the rock here. This is part of the quarrying process. Here are uh, several very large pieces of granite that have been quarried here. They've obviously been squared into big long rectangles. They're probably weighing 10 or 15 tons. For some reason, the stonemasons never moved these rocks down to the bottom. We've walked over four hours up here to this giant granite quarry. Here's another one of the stones that's been roughly squared, ready to be moved. You just have to wonder, right, why would they go through such difficult process? What motivated them to move such giant blocks of stone? They could have easily have built with much smaller blocks which have been much more easy to move. But as we've seen, they wanted to build with giant megalithic blocks. According to many archaeologists, the Incas didn't know about the wheel and they didn't have writing. But here we find actually a giant stone wheel with a hole in the middle. What was it used for? Was it actually part of moving the giant blocks? One of the mysteries here at the quarry. This is one of the giant blocks of granite that's been hewn here at the quarry. This one weighs many hundreds of tons. And in fact, we can see a saw mark here where the stonemasons were beginning to cut pieces of this block away.
quarry here at Machu Picchu. The Incas, uh, or whoever constructed Machu Picchu, had a ready supply of granite blocks right up here on the mountain. They left many of them in place, uh, but others were no doubt quarried and cut right here and then moved into a place where we see them today. These parts of Machu Picchu are very similar to Ayante, Tambo, and other areas. It's a stone or 10, 20, 30, 50 tons a piece. Here we actually see this wall is being pulled apart by earthquakes. Yeah, and this is the famous room of three windows right here. It's megalithic. It's perfectly fitted together. Oh, it's the kind of construction we see at the Valley Temple of Kefron in Egypt, uh, similar to what's in Abydos. Uh, it's also very similar to what we saw in Ollante Tombo. Let's look at these, this wall here. Again, another megalithic granite block. These smaller blocks are still perfectly fitted. And as you go higher to each tier here, the, the method of construction doesn't change. It's clear that the same engineer and stonemasons have made this entire wall. There's nothing uh, inferior about any part of it. Yeah, here we have bedrock, living rock, massive piece of granite. And now we have quarried stone perfectly fitted in with it. Yep. And it's, you know, it's this tremendous, perfect kind of construction that we're, we want to see and which is really indicative of uh, the, the ancient builders and the, the pre-Inca builders that we're talking about. I mean, oh, even just the lichen uh, patches on these rocks is indicative of, of great age. And it, the lichen patches are on the inside, meaning this wall has, has been pulled apart by earthquakes for a long time. In fact, I would say that, I mean, this wall that's, that, that's pulling apart here I mean, this has been going on for thousands of years, not, you know, not a few hundred. And in fact, no doubt, even at the time of the Spanish conquest or at the time of the Incas, this wall already looked like this. Here's one of the perfectly made megalithic walls here at Machu Picchu. Notice again the notching, some of the knobs, the perfectly cut blocks, perfectly fitted together. You can't even get a piece of paper in here. It's really, uh, it's really precise construction, very large lichen patches. Here are also these small niches, huge granite uh, ashlars here as a base, very fine construction. Look at this corner down here with a very precise cut corner locking these stones together, quite unusual. There's a lot of neat stuff in here. Yeah, this is the highest part of Machu Picchu here. That's uh, part of the hitching post of the sun. Here, uh, they would, at the summer solstice and stuff, they would hitch the sun and 
jaw, part of it was broken uh, a couple of years ago. But this is the highest part of Machu Picchu right here. And this giant block of granite, which was probably carved right in situ from bedrock, actually. It's thought to be the most important spot of Machu Picchu. Look at this uh, top of this wall right up here, how it appears to be like a zigzag. It's also locked in together. Yeah, yeah it's in, interlocked. Yeah. Interlocked. That's, inter that, that, that's fascinating. I mean, that's, that's a pretty fascinating. curious yeah. construction technique, wouldn't you say? Well, I mean, it's, they're building the uh, tops of the blocks the same way they are the faces. The faces in the, the jigsaw the polygonal thing, yeah. Increasing the, the surface contact between the blocks. Okay, right, the, the surface contact between the blocks has increased, so that makes them more secure and... Correct. Okay. But this, this is a particularly unusual room, you know, I always tell I'm talking about it. this giant block right here. I mean, that is weighing hundreds of tons right there. Uh, it's got the giant knobs down at the bottom. It, it would have originally been perfectly fitted right there, but now earthquake uh, and settling is pulling this whole megalithic wall apart. The idea that there's different levels of construction here is what I'm saying. Some archaeologists actually believe that the Incas never really knew about Machu Picchu either and that everything in Machu Picchu is pre Inca. Ah, okay. Well, there's certainly uh, two different styles of construction here, that's for sure. Okay, and that's what I've wanted to show you, is that, yeah, yeah there's, there's definitely a, a pre Inca, megalithic, perfect fitting type construction, and then a later construction that's, that's yeah. you know, much, much poorer in construction, really. In my mind, this door is a good example of different levels of construction. Here you see an earlier level of megalithic construction, but though it's not so perfect as no, some of the other things. What we were at That's right. So maybe this is then the second level of megalithic construction. The, right. And, but it's still a pretty good construction and using big stones. But once you get up to this level here and right above the door, you're into some pretty crummy, poor construction. I mean, uh, this is really your Inca construction up here, and this is your pre-Inca construction. Yeah, because they didn't even pretend to get that flat. You know, I mean, you can tell just by looking at it, it's, it's just not flat. I wouldn't even put a straight edge on that because it's obvious. Uh-huh, yeah. okay, yeah, right. But it's still pretty good construction, and it's, it's megalithic, really, yeah. One of the mysteries of Machu Picchu is why they built this megalithic city high up in the Andes here. In many ways, it's like a control city for the Urubamba and the lower jungle. Any tribes coming up from the lower jungle of the Amazon would have to pass through the loop of the Urubamba and Machu Picchu here. It's like a secret city, but also like a guard post to the upper highlands in the sacred valley. Machu Picchu was first discovered by the Yale historian Hiram Bingham in 1911. He was moving down the Urubamba River looking for the final capital of the Incas called Vilcabamba. He asked some locals uh, if they knew where there was a lost city in the vicinity and by paying one uh, 50 cents, he was able to find Machu Picchu. And he was suddenly pointed up and a guide took him here to the top of Machu Picchu, where he discovered this fabulous ruins, which are today the most popular tourist spot in all of South America.
While the Incas were excellent road builders, it is pretty much an established fact that many, if not most, of the roads in Western South America were actually pre-Inca. The Incas used their many roads throughout the Inca Empire to pass messages. These messages were in the form of quipus, knotted ropes with different colors and different kinds of knots and different uh, uh, numbers of knots in a string. These quipus held coded messages that only the royal Incas themselves could read. We're here at the end of the butterfly trail that goes to the Inca Bridge, just above Machu Picchu. Right here, the trail ends with this Inca Bridge with wooden planks across it on this cliff. Those wooden planks could be moved so that uh, people couldn't cross that bridge. But then, imagine this. The trail then, in ancient times, went up here and then along this green part on these sheer granite cliffs Incredibly, in ancient times, there was actually a trail there that was allowing Inca runners to pass along here. There must have been, in fact, some kind of structure coming out. It could have just been wooden beams sticking out from the wall. Uh, there would be holes there uh, in the granite cliff. And then another trail of wood and flat stones laid across so that runners and yamas could move across this area. This is the entrance to the megalithic city of Pizac. It's also in the Sacred Valley, like Ollante Tambo. Many archaeologists think that it too was built by the Incas, although we may find evidence that it is also a pre-Inca city. We're climbing up to the highest part of Pizac, and in fact part of the trail makes us go through this ancient tunnel. It's quite impressive really, and goes uh, all the way through this rock face. It may have been built by the Incas, or it may actually be pre-Inca. All right, let's go through it. Yeah, you, you come, start coming through here. I mean, this is all a man-made tunnel, and uh, it's pretty good inside here. I mean, the walls are rough. It's, uh, it's could have easily been made by the Incas, although it's a pretty impressive bit of engineering. And, well, there must have been quite a bit of effort just to cut through all this rock so that they can make the trail go through here. Possible that this was some kind of aqueduct also in the past. 
Quite impressive. We're right at the beginning of the sacred valley of the Incas. Fizak is here at one end, and then Ollante Tambo is at the far end of the sacred valley. Yeah, there's an amazing little trail here. Drop off is virtually sheer. So here's the city of Pizak. We've come through a tunnel along various cliffs. And now we're at this hilltop city of Pizak. Pizak is similar to Machu Picchu in that it's on top of a mountain looking out, in this case, over the sacred valley of the Incas. Now, if you look at the buildings in this royal section of Pizak, you'll notice that the stonework is, is very good stonework. But then we have this one building that is here kind of uh, in the middle, which is obviously of inferior stonework. Now, mainstream archaeologists are saying that this inferior building is the oldest building within this complex. And, Naturally then, the fine stonework building came later. But what I'm saying is exactly the opposite. That building with the inferior stonework is clearly the latest building in this complex. It was built by the Incas, while the other finer stonework is much older and is in fact pre-Inca. This wall is also made of uh, finely fitted blocks. Appears to be pre-Inca, in fact. Here we see Inca construction over here. This very large granite block is probably weighing 20 or 30 tons. Apparently it was a lintel above this wall. But this has all been dismantled many hundreds of years ago. And it's quite possible that even in Inca times, this gate looked exactly like this.
be in construction, you would not have a wall leaning out. So there had to be some uh, unique reason why they did that. Okay, I, I see what you mean. Yeah, I never thought of that before, but yeah, for them to build going out like that, they wanted that, and so why would they want that then? Um, to be, would it be like these were some acoustic things and they wanted a certain sound to come out of these well, towers? That would be something to ponder, I would think. This is one of the unusual square towers or chulpas here at Siustani. It's been torn apart. These are massive blocks here, weighing hundreds of tons probably in some cases. And behind it we see actually what was apparently a, a Inca type tower that was built on the inside of this already destroyed square structure. Now look at the size of these blocks right here. I mean, this is a, a tremendous, tremendous feat of engineering and uh, lifting. And where they brought them from, that's another question. But the size of this one alone must weigh over a hundred tons. Um, it's just incredible work. Incredible work. No, nothing, no machine precision again, but definitely uh, a tremendous feat, which obviously was lost. Obviously. Behind me is one of the towers at Siustani. This one is pretty much as it probably looked in ancient times. It came up, flaring outward, had a band near the top, and then it curved at the top. This megalithic tower is, is mysterious to archaeologists. Some think that it was used as a burial tower. Others think that it was an acoustic machine and that wind blowing across the tops of these towers created a constant whistling sound, much like the Andean flutes or panpipes. This rather unique stone circle here at Siustani, near to Lake Titicaca, was probably used for archaeo-astronomical purposes, such as marking the equinox and the solstice. In many ways, this is uh, very much like Stonehenge in England, used for uh, at least very much the same purpose. So this is the door of Amaru Muru, sometimes called the Stargate or the Devil's Door. It's carved into solid sandstone here in one of these odd rock formations right along the western shore of Lake Titicaca. You've got this inner door here, it's just about six feet tall. Then you got the greater outer door up there. Looks like it's about 24 feet high. This is most probably pre-Inca. May have been carved many thousands of years ago. The lichen patches right here are huge. That's usually indicative of quite a great age. What the purpose of this structure is, we don't really know. You have to wonder whether at some time other uh, walls were somehow connected to this. It's possible that giant stone blocks were interlocked into this giant door. Well, we really don't know. One of the interesting things about this door too 
is that it's essentially a, a false door, a door going nowhere. This is something that we also see in ancient Egypt where the Egyptians were known to build false doors, put them in tombs around the Giza Plateau, in the Valley of the Kings, other places in Egypt, we see these false doors. Okay, interesting. What Jose is saying is that the different legends are, one is that this is a, a stargate, a, a gate to other dimensions, and uh, by projecting your mind through this door, you, you can enter different dimensions. Another legend that he's saying is that this is the devil's door, and that through this door you go to the devil's church. And that this is, uh, of course, a bad thing. We're standing on the western side of Lake Titicaca. Right out there is the famous Island of the Sun. And to the right of it is the Island of the Moon. According to ancient Inca legend, this is where the first Incas appeared. The first Inca king, Manco Capac, and his wife, Mama Oclo, and also other brothers and sisters of them. They magically appeared on the Island of the Sun, allegedly coming through tunnels underneath the lake. And in fact, legend says that there is a tunnel beneath the lake that connects the Island of the Sun and the Island of the Moon. So after the Incas, had it first appeared on the island of the sun and the island of the moon, they then came ashore here on Lake Titicaca to tell the people who lived around here, the Aymaras, the Koyas, the Wari, that they had been sent from the sun god to civilize them, to build Cusco and to build a great empire of the sun. One of the mysteries of the Incas is that the time period of them is actually very near to the conquest. When the first Inca, Manco Capac, allegedly appeared on the Island of the Sun, the year was only about 1100 AD. In the next 400 years, suddenly the great Inca Empire appeared. And many archaeologists say that Cusco and Sacsayhuaman, and Ollante Tambo, Machu Picchu and other areas were all built during this period of time. But there's a mystery here, because all around Lake Titicaca are pre-Inca ruins such as Tiwanaco. These buildings were megalithic in scope. They had keystone cuts. They were giant granite buildings and pyramids. We know they were pre-Inca. Is it possible that some of the buildings are attributed to the Incas? are actually pre-Inca, like Tiwanaku? We're going to investigate that and find the answers. Here in this sunken temple, there is supposedly all the different races of mankind. Each one is different, no two are alike. And many of them are wearing turbans as the giant statues that we see. Bolivian archaeologists have actually reconstructed this whole temple, they call it the Sunken Temple. It's a curious, unusual head right there. Yeah, here at this main temple here at Tiwanaku, 
living archaeologists have actually re-erected most of these walls that you see, the just blocks that were lying around. But look at these giant stones here. They were already sitting here. Notice how incredibly worn they are. They certainly weren't originally quarried and cut this way. They would have been square blocks. But the weathering on them is, is so uh, incredible. I mean, it's as if they've been exposed for thousands of years even. And possibly some of this weathering must have been wave action, possibly from the shore of Lake Titicaca, washing across these giant blocks for hundreds, if not thousands of years. This block here is original, standing where it's always stood. In fact, originally Tiwanaku just existed of these giant slabs of stone. Look up at this one here, how it's notched up here. Other giant stones would have been fitted to this. These walls might have been twice as high as they are now, originally. This is the backside of the Ponce monolith, one of the most famous statues of Tiwanaku. Look at the top, he's wearing a turban. He appears to have a braided hair coming down his back. Uh, this is also how Etruscans wore their hair. He has hieroglyphs and uh, a Viracocha sun god carved on his back. Uh, the trousers he's wearing has different hieroglyphs and symbols on it. And then he's wearing um, some kind of uh, jewelry on his ankles, but he's in fact barefooted. This is another of the unusual monolith statues at Tiwanaku. Notice the goggle eyes. He also has tears coming down. Uh, some say he's crying for the Red Land or for Atlantis. He's wearing a turban. He's holding two uh, odd devices in his hands, possibly some kind of jade scepters, uh, get, showing his authority. Once again, he has what we say is two left hands. His, his right hand is in a position that's completely unnatural and impossible to actually have. Um, this is thought to be a, a kind of Egyptian type motif. He's wearing a, a belt that seems to have crabs on it. And then uh, his pants also have these unusual symbols or hieroglyphs on them. He also has uh, uh, some kind of um, chain around his feet and he's barefooted. So here's your standard keystone cuts here at Tiwanaku. You see the T cuts here and there's one on the corresponding side. You see more here. You always have two corresponding keystone cuts on each side. And in fact, this is exactly what we see at Ollante Tambo. This is also uh, a pre-Inca kind of construction. We know that Tiwanaku was built at least a thousand years, if not more, before uh, the Incas existed. In many ways, these keystone cuts are proof that the Incas were not building Ollante Tambo or the other buildings that we've seen around Cusco. This is the famous Gate of the Sun here at Tiwanaku. You can see how this megalithic piece of andesite has been split by an earthquake. In fact, this gate isn't really from this part of Tiwanaku. This gate is from the Pumapunku section of Tiwanaku, which is several kilometers over that way. If you look up here, you can see uh, the sun god Viracocha, he's holding two staffs on either side. These may have been jade scepters of authority. Notice too that his uh, has tears coming down his cheeks. He seems to be crying. These are sometimes called the tears of the sun. 
Gold is often called the tears of the sun here in South America. This is something of an indication that Tiwanaku was a massive metallurgical plant processing ores and creating gold, silver, and copper. Some people say too that Viracocha is crying for the red land, for Atlantis, the land that's been destroyed and no longer exists. This is the backside of the famous Gate of the Sun at Tiwanaku. And if you look at this, it's quite clear that it's been articulated to be part of other giant walls. It's the line on uh, this right side is coming down, but then it curves in and then comes straight down again. It would have had another giant wall fitted up against it. And in fact, we know that this is not the original position that uh, the Gate of the Sun was in. And even how it got to where it is, is something of a mystery. This is the famous Gate of the Moon. It's on the uh, east side of Tiwanaku. Smaller than the Gate of the Sun. It may well have also come from Pumapunku, which is several kilometers here uh, to our west. Notice the large lichen patches. It does have some uh, patterns and hieroglyphics in the center. It's carved out of one solid piece of andesite granite. Nicely articulated, although it's been heavily weathered. Creating a door out of completely solid rock like this is extremely difficult and it makes you wonder why they would even want to do that. Be much easier just to have two pillars and then a lintel across. But the builders of Tiwanaku actually wanted doors that were completely made out of one piece of solid rock. In this part of Puma Punku at Tiwanaku, we have what's called the typical trenching by archaeologists. What they've uncovered here is like a, a sluice, actually, probably for water. Part of this whole water complex that uh, was all over Tiwanaku and Puma Punku. And on these blocks here, we see the very clear keystone cuts that we were talking about at Ollante Tambo and other places. Here we see exactly how they are used with a keystone cut on either side of the block. And then liquid metal is poured into these cuts here, forming a clamp. This is a very unusual way of fitting large stones together. And we see it all over the world, in Egypt, in ancient Turkey, in ancient Greece. We see it at Ollante Tambo in Peru. And we see it here at Tiwanaku in Bolivia. Here on the east side of Pumapunku, we see how this whole structure has been destroyed by some giant tidal wave from Lake Titicaca or something. Massive blocks of sandstone and granite are just sitting uh, exactly as they fell. We have several feet of mud and muck from the tidal wave from Lake Titicaca that apparently destroyed this building and filled up the uh, blocks with mud and, and uh, stone here that we see. See, we can see how uh, the water conduits were originally fabricated here at Tiwanaku. They were covered like this with another piece of granite Water poured through uh, these conduits. It's a fascinating aspect here of Tiwanaku that this was like a water city. Water was pouring everywhere, out the walls. It was coming underground. The whole city today is, even we can see it during these new excavations, had uh, tremendous amounts of water flowing throughout the city. Right now we are looking around Tiwanaku and the Pumapunku section for a stone that will satisfy Chris that there was really ancient machining here in South America.
Yeah, and we have the same dimensions, uh, similar dimensions here. So the the cutter or the tool passed along this surface, cutting this step here, and then another one cut this surface. Now the interesting thing is that we have a very sharp corner here, which is extremely difficult to do, especially in stone. Uh, you don't do this with little balls just doesn't happen. And a toothpick and a grain of sand isn't going to work either. If we were to consider a more simple way of making this, such as using dolerite pounders, or using sand and wood, or sand and stone, we would not find the features that we find on this thing. And basically what we have are rough surfaces. And to create the kind of precision that we have on the stone would, call, would mean that a person would have to lap the stone and continue to lap it and lap it and lap it, which would take away a lot of the surface irregularities that we see on the stone. What I see indicates to me that this was cut with a machine and the tool just plowed through the material. And it didn't, it didn't need to be polished, but it is certainly very precise. Uh, well, I've taken measurements between the holes uh, to the edge of the stone to see what the distance has, is. And I've taken a measurement between each hole where I've been able to, some areas have been broken, I've been un unable to measure. But uh, essentially, it's running between 2.605 to 2.614. So <clears throat> considering that I'm really measuring the, the start of a groove uh, to a, an edge that is kind of broken in a way, uh, that's within 10 thousandths of an inch. I should imagine that statistically that would be perfectly straight with that edge. As you can see, the surface on this is absolutely incredibly, incredibly precise. David, come here. What have you found? Okay. I think we found something here. I think we found something that speaks of a high technology. This stone has all the characteristics of being a machine. Do you think the ancient times with, with what we would call modern machining techniques? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think we've found the holy grail here. <laughs> what this indicates to me is that this piece was put on a machine. Um, it was planed on one side and using this surface as a reference, this groove was cut uh, at a, a precise dimension from this surface. There is no way that this groove could have been created by just by chiseling it out or even rubbing it out uh, using a piece of bone or sand. Um, it's impossible to do that and achieve the characteristics that we have. Because what we would find if this was done by hand and painstakingly slow using bone and sand, you would find a very smooth surface on the inside of the groove. But we don't find a smooth surface on the inside of the groove. It's almost like a tool went through that and just plowed 
through the material. And the variations that we see are natural to any manufacturing process. So are you also saying that to create a block like this, you would have to have electricity and uh, you know, metal tools with diamond saws and things like that? Yes. Well, I think, David, we have to remember that this is a civilization that suffered a tremendous cataclysm. Uh, the whole culture was totally wiped out. And everything that supported the infrastructure that supported the building of this disappeared long ago. It could be actually under our feet, over there, over there. We don't know. But it's obvious that this particular site has been covered over by huge mudslides, uh, an uplift of the, of the plates of the earth, uh, a tremendous cataclysm that destroyed the civilization that created these. Okay, now in your opinion, do you think that the same civilization that was creating uh, what we see here at Tiwanaku also made what we saw at Ollante Tambo in Peru? I strongly believe that, yes. So you would say then that Ollante Tambo was not built by the Incas, but was built by the same people who built Tiwanaku? Uh, if not the same people, they possessed the same technology. How were these megalithic balls in Costa Rica built, and what were they for? What was the purpose of the pyramids? How were the megalithic walls of the Andes constructed? Join me, David Hatcher Childress, as we go around the world in search of lost cities and ancient mysteries.